Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. It's your boy, Mongo Slade. Today, we're going to talk about WWE biography, Booker T. I also read Booker T's book, From Prison to Promise, which came out in 2012. It, the book actually stops when he gets his deal with WCW, so it doesn't go into his WCW career at all. Much like his biography, it kind of <laughs> smooths over his WCW career. But, um... This this biography was inspirational. Booker T and MVP, as far as I'm concerned, have the two best stories in all of wrestling. You know, The Miz is a super overachiever, um, but he didn't have he didn't have to climb from the hole that Booker T and MVP had to. But since this is about Booker T, we're going to focus a lot on Booker T. Now, the episode of biography as a whole was a really good episode. They really leaned heavily into Booker T's backstory. Basically, his life growing up, losing his parents and everything. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, there was some things missing from his wrestling career. Um, you know, not they weren't big things, but they were things missing. And I'm pretty sure there's probably some people who want to say, well, they should have put that in there. We'll talk about that later, though. And, you know, probably near the end, because I really don't want to spend a lot of time on that stuff. Um, so we're going to I really want to talk a lot about Booker T's background and uh just basically flesh out a little bit of what the biography uh had to say so once again we're going to use the biography as a blueprint and i'm gonna fill in um with the biography with the book all right all right so let's go so the biography talked a lot about him being a mama's boy and that his dad you know they didn't, they didn't mention his dad at all in this uh, documentary he said you know his dad died when he was 10 months old but the story is that his dad went to go get some ice and his dad had a stroke. Um, he was in his 50s, I believe. And um, it was terrible. Booker T was not even a year old. His dad was in his 50s. His mom, I don't, I don't remember how old she was. Might have been in her 30s, which is pretty typical of, you know, Southern families or whatever for that age dis um, disparity. Booker T is the youngest of eight children. His mom had three from a previous marriage. And when she met his dad and then she had five children with him. So they moved from plain dealing, um, plain dealing Louisiana to Houston. Um, then his mom died when he was 13. She fell through a ceiling uh, while she was trying to fix an attic fan. And uh, she fell and fell on her neck and back. Um, she At first she thought she was going to be okay. She went to the hospital, had surgery. Everything was all right. Then they found fluid on her spine that was compressing her spine. It was um, uh, causing some paralysis in her legs. And they, she went for a follow-up surgery and never woke up. So apparently there was some kind of quote-unquote complications. And the family basically had her on life support for a little while. And then they had to pull the plug. But, um, you know, it was a very tough time because, you know, this made Booker T an orphan and you know the there were three of them still left of the, of the of the kids bonita lash was stevie ray and booker and not in that order i think lash was the oldest uh, of those three and uh the rest were kind of adults already so they kind of had flown off and done their own thing um so that's kind of where we start with booker t and the book talks extensively about his backstory um, and extensively about his sisters who were two of his sisters were in this document were in the biography um, Bonita and Carolyn they were both in the um, biography and he talks about basically just being uh, in sort of hanging around um, them and their boyfriends who were pimps and uh, hustlers and not gangbangers but dr drug dealers and that these guys were abusive and you know that he got into crime, not, you know, I mean, the, the, the robberies, the Wendy's robberies wasn't the first things that he actually done. You know, he had been boosting, which in the hood, if you don't know what that means, is you go into a department store and you steal clothes. Um, and that his, one of his sisters got him into boosting, um, his sister Carolyn, I got him into boosting. Um, they would basically just go into department stores and steal clothes. This was in the seventies. So it was a little easier to do than it is today. Boosting was a big thing when I was a kid. I used to, my mom used to know so many boosters. It's still a big thing today, but it's mostly um, people still in soap, shampoo, stuff like that. Um, but 
So that, I mean, it just was like a roller coaster with him because he would, you know, his whole early life was just him doing stuff he had no business doing, you know, selling drugs, boosting, trying to do different things to make money and to support himself. And uh, when he was 17, he got a 15 year old girl pregnant um, who ended up being the mother of his son, Brandon, who was not in the documentary because he was in prison or in jail rather. Um, Brandon is in his thirties now. Um, so, you know, Booker had to raise him once he got out of prison, he had to raise his son by himself. So that's, 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 that's the ground floor of the Booker T stories that his family and not just his neighborhood, but his entire family, because his family was fractured by his parents dying. And the older kids didn't really take care of the younger ones. Um, they did, you know, some of them. They were around, but they didn't really take care of them. Like, you know, you would think. They didn't make sure they went to school or anything. And he actually had lost contact with Stevie Ray for like four years or something like that. It was it, it was insane. So that's really the, the groundwork that leads into the robberies. And um, so let's, ta let's, let's talk about the robberies. Now, they talked about the robberies in... Uh, in the biography and basically he says that you know the, the the there was a specific manager in wendy's that used to give them a tough time and that pretty much made them uh, upset but the to flesh it out a little bit uh booker t has started hanging around these these guys all right so the guys were named zachary claiborne who had been arrested for uh robberies before and wendell sylvester uh, who was just a friend of Booker's. They used to um, be in like an Adidas uh, crew. They basically would just wear matching Adidas jumpsuits. And they basically had nicknames. They didn't have a crew name, like a gang name, but they just kind of had nicknames. And um, Booker's thing was he was he was called Nature Boy from, you know, based on Ric Flair. And Zach was called Z-Boy. And Mr. Big Stuff was Wendell. Um, there were two other guys that, um, one of whom was, uh, Booker T's cousin, but they weren't involved with the robbery. So there's no point in mentioning them. And, uh, Booker T and Zachary actually worked at Wendy's and that, uh, um, they were Zachary, um, just up and quit and Booker basically quit not too long afterwards and they were smoking weed and Zachary is the one who brought up the idea to rob, um, Wendy's. He basically said, hey, look, we still got our uniforms. We should just rob the Wendy's. And Wendell was down and they said, Booker T, you be the, the getaway driver. So Booker T would take his auntie's car, drive them to the robberies, and they would do the robbery. And on their first robbery, they made $800. So for the next several months, they would hit about 12 Wendy's. For some reason, there was something in there in the documentary where they had 26 there might have been some other ones that maybe Booker T wasn't involved in, but Booker T's book and every other source that I've read, which I think is another article on the undefeated, uh, all of them just say he got 12. You know, they, they did 12 robberies over the next four months. Um, they made the newspaper, and that's basically when uh, Booker T figured that things were getting kind of hot. It's when they st he started seeing them in the newspaper. He started hearing about the Wendy's bandits in the newspaper. So basically, um, they would hit these robberies. They made something between four hundred or four thousand dollars for every hit. It was very quick money for all of them. They was giving money to a guy named Terry. They was giving him money because he was around, but he wasn't involved with the robberies. So they continued to do robberies, and on in April ninth, nineteen eighty seven, Booker T for the first time stopped being the getaway driver and actually went in to one of the Wendy's to help rob the store. This was the only time he had ever done it. And this was the last one. So uh, the Crime Stoppers offered $5,000 for their capture. Uh, Zachary Claiborne's girlfriend, who was named Robin in the book, it might not be her real name, but um, she turned them in for the $5,000 reward. And then they were arrested. The very same day, April 9th, 1987, Booker T and Zach were arrested at the Willow Creek Apartments in Houston. Booker T was 21 or 22 years old. I think he was 22 because his birthday is March the 1st. Um, they were surrounded by SWAT. They were sent to the Harris County Jail. Um, while Booker T was in jail, basically he says that he, uh, he learned how to play chess and he listened to the radio and that Zach and Wendell were also locked in the same jail. 
And uh, occasionally, if they was able to, they would sit down and, and chat with each other. Um, he was facing somewhere between 10 and 50 years for prison. Um, he said they, they gave him an opportunity to plead guilty. If he pled guilty on two counts of armed, aggravated assault and armed robbery, he would get at most five years each run concurrent. And uh, since he had been in prison nine months by the time they offered him this deal, he would essentially have to do another 12 to 14 months. So um, essentially, since he had a, a child and since he knew he was guilty, he just admitted it. And he admitted to being guilty. So he went to Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville where he was locked down 22 hours a day. Um, his sister never did come, never, his sisters never came to visit him. And they were in the uh, biography. They basically, um, basically Benita, who was the closest to him in age, um, says that she didn't want to, she didn't want to see him that, that way. She didn't want to see him locked down. You know, it was a very, it was a very tough time, very tough thing that everybody had to go through. And um, he's, he, in the book, he talked a little bit about being in jail and being being in prison, you know, in the biography he talked about being on the chain gang. I don't know if chain gang still exist um, or existed at the time. I'm pretty sure they don't exist now, or if they do, they're probably real low key in the moment. You know, certain people find out they exist, they'll probably be not existing for much longer. But um, Booker T was in prison until 1989. So when Booker T gets out of prison, um, he needs somewhere to live. He was living with his sister for a little while. Then he went and moved in with Lash, a.k.a. Stevie Ray. He got out of prison. It became a situation where he was trying to get custody of his son, Brandon. Now, Brandon is the son that he had with the 15-year-old girl. Uh, she had gotten into drugs really bad and basically just gave the baby up while he was in prison. His sister, Carolyn, was uh, constantly keeping contact with the kid and was trying to get him, but because, you know, she needed Booker T in order to get him, and he was in the foster care and in and out and all that kind of stuff. So when Booker T got out of prison, it took him a year of, you know, finding a job. He had to go move in with Lash. That's when he started working at, I believe, uh, American Mini Storage. Was a, well, he got a job as a security guard first, and then he got a, jo a job after he got released as a security guard because they found out that he was an ex-con. They, he got a job at American Mini Storage, and that's where he worked when he got custody of his son. So from there, um, there's a there's some other little tidbits that might have been that, that were interesting. Uh, Lash was friends with a guy named Tony Norris. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Tony Norris is, but it's Ahmed Johnson, the WWF wrestler Ahmed Johnson. Lash was friends with him, and they actually used to be worked unofficial security for some like night, nightclubs. This was in uh, Booker T's book. So um, it was Lash who gave them the idea to get into wrestling. They had been wrestling fans their whole lives. They had watched Houston wrestling. Both of them had also started working out as well. Um, Booker had saw how big Lash had gotten, and he wanted to know how he, you know, how he could get so jacked. So basically, Booker T, and they said it in the biography that he looked up to book to, to Lash, or AKA Stevie Ray, um, and that he was, you know, that was one of his heroes. And that whatever Lash was getting into, he wanted to get into it. So when Lash was getting into weightlifting and working out, Booker T did the same thing. And that's kind of how they started to gain muscle. They weren't even in wrestling yet. But that's how they just kind of started just getting big, just for positive reinforcement, just to, you know, have something to build their confidence and different things like that. So then it was Lash's idea to get into wrestling. And they went to uh, Ivan Putsky's school. Now, Ivan Putsky was in the biography episode, which was very fucking cool. It's always cool to see old wrestlers. But considering I had read this book, Booker T did not have anything nice to say about Ivan Putsky in the book. <laughs> he didn't have anything nice to say about Ivan Putsky in the book. In the book, he talked about Ivan Putsky essentially being a useless trainer, that he didn't know much about wrestling and that he was basically just a gimmick. And that, you know, they had been tricked by the gimmick into thinking that he was some big star, but the guy didn't know anything about wrestling, and that the real trainer was Scott Casey. They showed a picture of Scott Casey in the biography, but this is the true reason why you should watch the biography episode if you didn't bother to watch it. It's because they had uh, WWA footage, Western Wrestling Alliance. That's what it was called. That's what uh, Ivan Putsky's uh, school was called, and they provided the wrestling for Houston wrestling, which was still being shown locally. 
in um, Houston. So WWA, Western Wrestling Alliance, uh, was the school run by Ivan Pusky, but the head trainer was Scott Casey. In the biography, they showed a lot of the GI Bro stuff, a lot of the early, early GI Bro, where he was really learning how to, you know, when he was showing people how to work out and he was doing hip tosses and that stuff was fucking gold, right? That stuff was amazing stuff. It was really good. This document, this biography, it kicked up another notch, obviously, when the wrestling stuff started. Then things got really important, you know, and I was really, like, intrigued. You know, I, I was not not so much in WCW, but in the, the WWA and the GWF stuff, because that's not a lot of stuff that I've sat down and watched. And I only think WWA material is even available for me to watch. In the book, he talked about how upscale the WWA operation was. That there was multiple TVs in the building so they could record different angles. He already had television and that the program cost $3,000 for eight weeks. So they would get a solid eight weeks of training will be five days a week. Um, and it was, it was, it sounded like it was a good hookup, you know, it sounded like it was pretty cool. So, uh, WWA is where he created the concept of GI bro. Now the, um, the help with the development of GI bro, there's a contrast between the biography and the book. In the book, he basically said it was Scott Casey that helped him come up with the concept of GI Bro. In the biography, they told the story of him working in the mini storage and somebody had pretty much abandoned one of the units. And in the unit was a, 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 an army hat and that he would take the army hat and he would basically, that would be the beginnings of GI Bro. And he basically said Scott Casey kind of helped him put it together. And he's talked about wanting to be, you know, replace Sergeant Slaughter. As he said, like, I guess this was around the time that Sergeant Slaughter had did the heel turn. Because he said that, you know, it was around the time of the Gulf War. So I'm thinking this was around the time Sergeant Slaughter was turning heel and, and doing the whole Iraqi sympathizer gimmick. Because he kept talking in the book about wanting to replace um, Sergeant Slaughter and be, in, be on G.I. Joe and be a superhero for the kids and... And that kind of thing. And that was the general idea behind it, is that he would be like this eternal baby face. And, um, but in the biography, he basically gave credit to Scott Pusky, uh, saying that it was Scott Pusky's idea. So it's hard to know which is which. Um, the book has been out for a while. Maybe he misremembered, or maybe he's risk remembering now. Who knows? But G.I. Bro ended up being very popular. And uh, he was able to get a nice little run out of WWA. For you know, another little addition is that Lash had a, a gimmick. It was called the Super Collider, the Atom Smasher. Super Collider, the Atom Smasher. What an incredible name. <laughs> that sounds like something a kid put together, even though he's probably in his mid-20s at the time. Anyway, um, he was tag teaming with a guy named Avon Riley. I believe they said the guy used to play football. Uh, that was Lash's tag team partner. And they did an angle where Lash and Riley jumped Booker T or jumped G.I. Bro. And it looked so realistic that his sister Gail uh, jumped in the ring to try to help him. <laughs> and then she figured that's when they was, they had, you know, was finally getting good at the whole wrestling thing. Um, working in WWA, they was only making a hundred dollars a night. Um, but that ended up getting cut down to $25 a night. Because WWA was going broke. Um, in the book, he started talking about um, Pusky was spending too much money on big name talent, had overextended the TV production and gave undeserved jobs to family, basically nepotism. And that, you know, there was some beef between those guys and Ivan Pusky because he was trying to turn them against each other. Basically, he would tell Booker he was the best student. He was better than Lash and all that kind of stuff. And then he would turn around and tell Lash, like, hey, you know, your brother's going to leave you in the dust. You know, he's not going to, you know, help your career. You know, he's only helping himself. And basically, there was like, you know what, enough is enough. We didn't want to deal with this. And therefore, they left. So um, they didn't go in. They mentioned uh, Texas All Pro Wrestling in the biography, but they didn't go into any detail on it. So I guess I'll talk about it here. So Texas All Pro Wrestling was promoted by a guy named Tugboat Taylor. And Booker T says that, <laughs> that the guy had nothing and could pay nothing, but they just wanted to stay busy. So that's where they worked. Um, Taylor said that the boys um, would had to sell their own tickets in order to get paid. And they would get a cut of the tickets they sold. 
So Booker T was given 15 tickets and he had to go um, sell those tickets, which of course he was able to do because he knew so many people back in Houston. So then he sold the tickets and he had to wrestle Killer Tim Brooks on the show. And he basically said that Killer Tim Brooks, Killer Tim Brooks is a you know, notorious trainer. He's, you know, one of the guys that helped train Keith Lee. Um, and that Killer Tim Brooks was very stiff. He beat the shit out of Booker T, apparently. He beat, just beat the crap out of him. And, and then he gave him his comeback. You know, he gave him the comeback, boom, did the job for Booker. Um, or G.I. Bro, rather. And backstage, um, Killer... Killerton Brooks basically said, like, hey, look, I was just testing you. You know, sorry about kicking your ass, but I was just testing you. So they walked up to Tugboat Taylor to get paid. He paid Killerton Brooks $500. He paid Booker T $10. $10. And Booker T flipped out on him. Cussed him out, telling him he was a piece of shit. He'll never work for him again. So then uh, they were still floating around Texas. They went to Amarillo to wrestle some guys named the Young Guns. There is where Skandar Akbar first saw them. He was a talent scout for a global wrestling federation, the GWF. And he told them to come to Dallas and uh, he would see if they can, they got a spot for him. So while they were in Dallas, they met Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert, who was the booker at the time for a global wrestling federation. And uh, they really just wanted Lash because he was bigger and he looked more like a wrestler. He was more intimidating. Uh, but Booker T just tagged along. And they talked about this in the, uh, in the, in the biography. So I'm not, you know, uh, stepping over the biography. So it was, um, uh, it was here that they first started actually doing tags. They had never actually tagged with each other up to this point. They actually joked in the biography about lying about that, where they had always been opponents. They had never been partners because Lash worked mostly as a heel. Um, but in, uh, the Global Wrestling Federation, they was going to be wrestling as a tag team. So they got to wrestle in the Sportatorium. Eddie Gilbert really liked both of them, was going to give them the opportunity. He is the one who gave Lash the name Stevie Ray. And that uh, um, he told Booker T to wrestle as Booker T. And, and so kind of G.I. Bro disappeared. And um, this is where they came up with the name The Ebony Experience. So The Ebony Experience comes from uh, Mr. Ebony, who is a uh, Houston-based wrestler. Uh, that they used to watch on TV, and he was one of the few black guys that they saw on television growing up. And when they used to lift weights, they used to have weight belts called, you know, and on the weight belt would be Mr. Ebony 1, which would be Lash, and Mr. Ebony 2, which would be Booker. So they was basically obsessed with this guy. So um, Mr. Ebony expired them to put Ebony 1 and Ebony 2 on weight belts that they had when they were working out, just working out. They weren't even wrestling yet. And now that they're becoming the wrestlers, they named their tag team the Ebony Experience. I thought this was pretty sweet. You know, it's a way of paying it forward, showing that, you know, hey, and they kept saying this and they said it in the WWE Treasures episode, which we'll do separately, that, you know, Booker T was one of those kids that was watching. And he says that he always remembers that there are children watching him, that there are kids watching. So the whole Mr. Ebony weight belts. And the whole Ebony experience thing kind of proves that he was watching this black guy in a mask. You know, they didn't know what the guy's name was. They didn't know what he looked like. But they knew, like, he was a cool black wrestler on the show. And he was sort of, you know, one of their heroes. So I thought that was pretty damn dope. And I, well, I, I'm glad that they mentioned that in the biography because I thought that was pretty cool. So Eddie Gilbert told them that he was going to bring them in. He was going to pay them $100 per appearance. And they was going to have a five show deal with um, and that, you know, the Global Wrestling Federation had a deal with ESPN. They would make five appearances for one hundred dollars a piece and that they were to, you know, come back to Dallas in a week or whatever to to do the work or whatever. This was in 1992. So uh, they left. Were super excited. They had finally gotten, you know. Big time money, you know, big time work, even though it's the same money they was making in, a, in the wrestling school. But um, they turned around. They came back the next week and found out that Eddie Gilbert had been fired. Eddie Gilbert was gone. And now Skandar Agbar is the booker of Global Wrestling Federation. Eddie Gilbert getting fired is not anything new. If you guys are following the channel religiously, you know that Eddie Gilbert got fired as the booker of ECW. Eastern Championship Wrestling back in those, which was probably two or three years after he got fired from GWF. <laughs>
So Skandar Akbar booked them against some two guys named Brute Force. It was basically two thuggish guys, two thuggish white dudes, and reminiscent of the Nasty Boys. And um, basically, the, the they talked about this in the biography, that the audience was absolutely brutal. You know, the Dallas audience was brutal in the sportatorium. Uh, very racist and yelled things at them. And in the book, he talked about them throwing tobacco spit at him. Cup, you know, they spit in cups. You know, when he chewed tobacco, they spit it in the cup, and they would throw that stuff at them. And he said they also threw, like, half-eaten corn dogs. But during the match, and they talked about this in the biography, too, he did the first spinneroni. Now, he says that, you know, this wasn't the first, first spirit spinneroni, but this was the first major spinneroni. And that he had done the spinneronis before because he had been expired by, you know, um, breakdancing. And I was glad they kind of talked about this in the biography. It, you know, some people was kind of like, why are they talking about breakdancing? As you have to look at it from the perspective of Booker T at this point in time would have been 24 or 25. And uh, in the 80s, breakdancing was a big thing in the hip hop communities. Break dancing was one of the four pillars of hip hop, according to African Bombada, who was a pedophile, by the way. But uh, it was DJing, breaking, graffiti, and rapping. You know, so um, they it was a big thing at the time. Even though break dancing was kind of a kind of played out, like I didn't see a lot of break dancing when I was a kid in the early nineties. I would have been a little young; I'd have been about seven around the time here. But I didn't see too many people break dancing. There's a lot of people rapping, some people DJing. A lot of people doing a lot of graffiti, but not a lot of breakdancing. But um, mixing breakdancing and wrestling seems like a natural fit and is a very entertaining thing. And um, to see, like, they actually noticed that and was like, yeah, we should talk about that. Because Booker T kind of talked about it a little bit in the book. But basically, he basically just said that like, breakdancing was a thing that they did. Because they were kids in the 70s and in, in the early 80s. You know, he would have been... Uh, what 16 or 17 in the 80s so it was a uh, an important thing in that culture and that when the white audience saw him do the spin rooney for the first time they actually changed they flipped and they became fans of his they actually got started getting behind the ebony experience and they actually became like one of the more popular groups in uh, gwf so in the biography, they show pictures of Bonita in the crowd when they won the Global Force Wrestling, Global Force, Global Wrestling Federation Tag Team Championships. It was a big crowning achievement. And they talked about how happy they were in the book because, you know, these are two kids who used to watch wrestling on TV. Now they're not only out there doing it, but they're the pinnacle of a nationally televised product. They're on ESPN. You know, like Global Wrestling Federation didn't last very long, but, you know, it was national TV, you know, so it was it was dope for them, you know, and they really kind of thought it was awesome. And they, and they got to share it with their sisters who were there. And I really liked the uh, that they showed the footage, you know, of them, you know, of the of Bonita being in the crowd. I also enjoy looking at the footage of GWF. Um, I think, uh, can you watch that stuff on old, like, ESPN app or something like that? I would love to sit down and watch it a little bit, because the, the network is almost unwatchable now. So, man, I need something else to watch. <laughs> but, um, it was fun. And basically, this was, this was really good. And, um, they, they spent 18 months in Global Wrestling Federation. They said that a referee named James Beard helped Booker T get booked in Japan and Korea. And he was basically finally starting to make a living in wrestling. And then Maniac Mike Davis contacted him saying that Sid Vicious, who was trying to impress the offices in WCW, he was trying to become the booker. Um, and that he wanted to impress WCW by finding new talent. Apparently he had just left the WWE Splash in WCW. So he brings in the Ebony Experience where they are renamed Harlem Heat. Now, this is a missing piece of uh the documentary and you know it's also not in the book is that the original gimmick for booker t and stevie ray when they were brought into wcw so the the characters were uh the chain gang let's put it like that so the idea um stevie ray says that the idea was their idea so here's the idea the idea was they're going to be two in formerly incarcerated brothers who are being brought into WCW. They were wearing dog collars with chains. 
and the chains were going to represent, you know, them being unjustly um, arrested, them being unjustly put in prison. And they were going to beat people with the chains uh, in order to, you know, rectify or bring in some type of justice for them being unjustly incarcerated. Now, um, Colonel Robert Parker was not supposed to go out with them. They, uh, he was sent out with them. And since they were two black dudes wearing dog collars, and I believe they were, were also wearing prison jumpsuits, this uh, gave them the appearance of being, you know, a, a slave gimmick or something to that effect. And uh, this is absolutely absurd. It was an absurd idea. Now, here's the thing. A lot of really bad ideas uh, that comes from uh, black wrestlers and it ends up getting put on white promoters like uh, <laughs> like Kamala, like Kamala. I think Kamala was created with the with the help of Jerry Lawler. But he once it worked, he started doing Kamala himself. There were there was also the gimmick of crime time, which was the idea of JTG. That was his idea. But you ask anybody today, they'll say crime time was a racist gimmick. And it's that kind of stuff that's just been going on in wrestling for a long time where wrestlers would do their own thing. Um, and then people would say, oh, it's the promoter forcing this guy to do a, an Arab oil gimmick. Like they were talking about Skandar Agabar or they would, uh, they forced the Iron Sheik to be the Iron Sheik. It was like, what else? It was the idea of the promoter's wife, you know, the Iron Sheik, but he had to do it himself, you know? Um, so they essentially came up with these characters uh, this is also, you know, they didn't say this, but I can tell you this because I know this, there is a naughty by nature song called the chain remains. And it basically has the same concept that they're talking about is that, you know, you wear chains or you wear a chain to remind you of the unjust car incarceration or the unjust treatment that black people went through in the United States. And therefore, you know, they wear chains. Now the junkyard dog wore a chain for a different reason. But we'll talk about that in the Treasures episode when I'll talk a little bit more about the Junkyard Dog. So that was the original, uh, their tryout match in WCW. Um, Stevie Ray says it was never supposed to make air. It was never supposed to, you know, and Robert Parker was never supposed to be with them. Colonel Robert Parker, who was basically uh, Colonel Sanders from the KFC box. Um, he was never supposed to be with them. Somebody sent him out there with them and that gave the appearance. But that was never what they were supposed to be. It was just something they were trying out. Then, of course, they they were brought into WCW as Kane and Cole Harlem Heat. And then, of course, they, they dropped the names Kane and Cole and became uh, Booker T and Stevie Ray. So in the biography, now the book stops, you know, when, hey, we're, we're packing up and going to Atlanta. You know, we, <laughs> you know, that's kind of where the book stops. Now we have to talk about the biography pretty much on its own now. And uh, they talked about the success of Harlem Heat. You know, Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan and, you know, some people from WCW was in this documentary and they talked about the success and how they, Booker T saw Brooks and Dunn, a, uh, a country uh, unit, country duo, and they had shirts with flames on it. He thought that was pretty cool and it fit the gimmick of Harlem Heat. So he got a lot of those shirts and he would cut the sleeves off and those sleeves were the hats. <laughs> so that's how they got the flame hats because they cut the sleeves off the shirts. Um... And they were just two badass black dudes and, the, and their characters were their personalities turned all the way up. And he, he talked about almost starting a riot in Sturgis uh, for Road Wild. You know, talk to people telling them, they, oh, you need to chill out because, uh, you know, the Hell's Angels are out there. They don't even know who the hell the Hell's Angels are. They even mentioned Booker T saying the nigger word on TV, which, of course, it created a very viral moment with Booker T. You know, it's very unfortunate for Booker. But he talked about, he said that was the first time anybody had ever heard him say it. And it was the last time he had said it. But that was something that he kind of grew up with. It's a cultural thing. You know, you say it all the time. But he says he, he never said it after that. I don't believe that, though. Then he started talking about um, his singles career. And he never really thought about it until it happened. And they spent some time talking about WCW was the biggest wrestling company in the world. And they started talking about yo NWO. And now that WCW is going to be on top. And then all of that stuff is immediately undercut with Booker T saying, I didn't care about the war. It didn't have nothing to do with me. I was like, you just spent like four minutes telling the, 
<laughs> it's been like three minutes, three or four minutes telling this casual ass audience about, about, you know, uh, the WCW and WCW is now the number one wrestling company in the world. And then Booker T immediately says like, so they ain't nothing to do with me. I was just doing my job. I was just there trying to be the best that I can be. But of course they were setting it up. Um, so they could talk about him being world champion, um, which, you know, made sense. But they also took some time to talk about his marriage to Charmel, which um, he got married to Charmel because she was a Nitro girl. Um, I think like three or four of those Nitro girls ended up marrying wrestlers. So basically, Bash at the Beach 2000, he spent some time put, setting that up, you know, the nonsense between Hogan and Jarrett. I'm pretty sure Russo and Disco and everybody else is going to talk about that. I'm not going to waste my time going into it. Um but Booker T basically says that he had 10 minutes to prepare and that WCW hadn't had a black world champion since Ron Simmons. And so he was, he want, really wanted to uh, make an impact and he was really proud. And at the moment his life changed when he became the world champion because, you know, he remembered everything that he had that he had went through. And this is now the pinnacle of a career that he spent, you know, I think at by this time, eight years in a little bit more than that, maybe, t maybe nine years you know, struggling from the Texas independence all the way up to being the top of the number one wrestling company in the world. So that was pretty badass. And um, Jarrett says that he was proud of being the guy who was able to drop the belt to him. I know that Vince Russo will say the part of the, the whole thing was to get the belt on Booker T. You know, um, I don't believe it. Uh, so basically, um, Booker T was the guy in WCW. He left WCW with two belts, the U.S. title and the WCW World Heavyweight title, and he was brought into the WWF on top, which is something that is very underrated. And I think a lot of people, when they say WCW is getting buried, they forget that Booker T came in on top. He ended up wrestling Austin and Rock right out of the gate. Um, he didn't win these matches clean, but he was put in the position right out of the gate. Um, they also talked about him hurting Austin, him dropping Austin on the uh, on that table. Austin basically says, like, hey, I know a lot of people were grumbling because he brought this guy in to work on top. And the first night in the building, he he hurts, he broke Steve Austin's back. But, you know, Steve Austin said, hey, look, I slipped off the table. You know, Booker T didn't do anything wrong, but he took the heat. You know, he got the heat from the boys and basically he took it, you know. And, um, you know, Vince even popped up in here for his very, 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 very brief uh, he was all over the Stone Cold Steve Austin one. He was kind of on the Randy Savage one. Um, he was all over the Roddy Piper one too. But, you know, the Booker T one, he just really had one thing. He started talking about Vince, you know, his Booker T's ability to relate to the audience. And then they spent the rest of the documentary uh, talking about Booker T's ability to connect with the audience and his ability to grow as an entertainer. And that, you know, um, Booker T was inspired by movies. He he watched movies all the time. And he says, like, in WCW, he had to be, like, this badass black dude because that's really what Harlem Heat was. He didn't really get a chance to be uh, comedic or to, you know, expand what he can do. So WWE gave him the opportunity to be silly. And they showed a lot of his, you know, comedic stuff with him with the lightsaber and him doing stuff with Kevin Nash and, you know, the, the brief NWO stuff he did. And they also talked about the legendary attempt to get Undertaker to do a spinneroni, which I remember every time I see that, it, I just laugh so hard because The Rock does a shitty spinneroni. The Vince McMahon does a shitty spinneroni, which is tremendous. The fact that Vince McMahon would do a spinneroni is tremendous, bro. Then you had <laughs> you had them trying to put peer pressure on Undertaker to do the spinneroni, and of course, it does not work. Uh, so they also talked about King Booker, um, and basically talked about the, the contrast of the character. Kofi Kingston was in the documentary saying, you know, Hey, look, you know, Booker T had always been this raw, real homeboy. And now he's King Booker. He's completely flipped on a dime. He's doing something completely different. Now he's pretending to be elegant. He's pretending to have class, but if you upset him, he's flying off the handle and he starts code switching. Which, for people who don't know, is that is when you talk, start talking properly in African-American vernacular and all that kind of stuff. And then you get around other people, you start speaking like, you know, you wanted the homeboys from the south side or the east side or whatever, right? 
So Booker T, basically, that was the character. He started talking with a British accent because that's how kings are supposed to talk. And then he get pissed off and he go, man, niggerish on you. So, but that was, that was all pretty cool. And he started talking about um, his family now that he's got, you know, unfortunately his son was in jail, I guess, during the recording of this biography. I don't know if he's still in jail or not. Uh, but he started talking about his, his new kids. You know, he's got twins. They are eight years old now. He now runs reality of wrestling and they have local TV in Houston and everything is, you know, been awesome since he got out of prison. He's just basically clawed and scratched and made his way to the top. And this biography was fantastic. It was, it was fucking good. It was very inspirational. People, you know, I think it was probably one of the, probably going to end up being one of the least watched because I, I was paying attention and I don't think that many people were watching it or, you know, people don't have the memories of Booker T that they had of Randy Savage or Roddy Piper or Steve Austin. So this is a very curious decision to even do a Booker T documentary, but I'm glad they did it because he's got a hell of a story and his story needs to be told and it needs to be told again and again and again, you know. And I really, really enjoyed it. But let me know what you guys think if you bothered to watch it. Um, please uh, like this video. Please hit subscribe. Subscribe via subscribe star. Subscribe. Um, sit. Send me money uh, via cash app. I can always use shawarma, especially when I got the, my case of the dry throat, like I do right now. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys for your time. And I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out.